Over the years, many, many circuits have come and gone. Some are quite similar to how they originally were. Some have been modified quite extensively because of safety concerns, and some are mere shadows of their former, faster, deadlier selves. Some are just... awful. And if you know me, you'll know that I love to race virtually. Admittedly, I haven't done much since my last sim racing livestream in March, I think it was, where I slammed a Subaru into a telegraph pole on the very first stage of the rally, but when it comes to doing that same virtual racing, there are only two tracks that exist, Spa and the Nordschleife, in a GT3. Seriously, Spa, GT3, it's so dull, it's so overdone, race something else. But there is a third track. Well, fourth, because Bathurst exists a fifth because Silverstone exists, a sixth because Road America exists, and a seventh because Le Mans exists. There is an eighth track, and that track is called Suzuka. In the late 1950s, Soichiro Honda made a statement at a meeting of the Honda bosses and board members that was very simple. Cars can't be improved if they're not put through their paces at a racing circuit. At this point in time, the fledgling Japanese motor industry was doing all of its road testing during a race held near Mount Asama, a volcano that last erupted back in 2009. But this was more for bikes, and used as a proving ground for bikes, the likes of which were being built by Honda, Kawasaki, Suzuki, and Yamaha. Mount Asama, A-S-A-M-A, -A, is located pretty much smack in the middle of Honshu Island, the main island of Japan. Honda-san had been to the Isle of Man TT in the middle of 1954 to see what was what, and decided to take the idea back with him to Japan, because he'd seen the TT test man and machine to the absolute limit, and had seen that European motorbikes were built to a much higher standard to what the Japanese were producing. So in 1955, Honda helped to organise this event that was officially called the All Japan Motorcycle Endurance Race that was held in the area around Mount Asama. It was a 192 kilometer course on off-road terrain to really test the ability of these motorbikes. And while Honda won the 350 and 500 cc classes, it was Suzuki that was getting all the plaudits. The reason for it all being on dirt is because the manufacturers involved hadn't agreed to the construction of a tarmac course. Getting the funding for such a project was impossible. Unfortunately though, there's not a lot of information regarding the actual layout of this course. I can't find a map anywhere. And also, there's not a lot of information about the race either. I mean, there is quite a bit on Honda's own website. You know, Honda's website being quite a good source for the majority of this video, so I'll leave links to both the articles referenced in the description so you can read them at your own leisure. I've taken the most important bits, but there's more details in there you might find interesting. But the legacy of the race is still very, very strong. Not many people were actually aware of any road racing happening in Japan about 60 years ago. And all I can find is a picture of the actual mountain. But like any engineering arms race, the speeds got too much for the circuit. The performance of these bikes had reached a point where safety was a concern, and there was now a group of enthusiasts known as Kaminari Zoku, which is Japanese for groups of thunderous riders. Which, let's be honest, is a f***ing cool name. What was meant as a cheap, accessible means of transportation in post-war Japan was now a social problem. Motorbikes in Japan were considered working vehicles. Now, though, they're treated as... Well, enthusiast vehicles like a lot of high-powered motorbikes over here. Honda's website explains that Honda-san had a basic philosophy, and that was Honda, unlike other manufacturers of goods, had to protect the irreplaceable commodity that is human life. So when the final Asama race was held in 1959, Honda made that statement of building a racetrack, so that Honda could develop faster motorbikes that were easier and more predictable to ride. Honda had also been at the Isle of Man TT for the first time in 1959, and he needed a place to do testing. Honda put together a design team headed by Takeo Fujisawa, I hope I've got that right, who was the managing director of the company at the time. So this design team went out to Europe and started looking at tracks like Brands Hatch and Silverstone and Monza, mainly the purpose-built ones rather than airfield conversions or road courses, to see what was what, see how they were built, see how the corners were, see what the facilities were like, so that they had more than just a piece of tarmac dumped somewhere in Japan, they had something that was world class and could rival anything in Europe. They also looked at the spectator facilities because they wanted to attract the Japanese public to racing events, and after spending a lot of time analysing the race courses of Europe, Honda then had to find a site to put his new track. They knew how much land they needed, somewhere in the region of about 750 square kilometres that would easily contain 6 kilometres or so or track. After some deliberation, they chose a plot of land close to the city of Suzuka because of its geographic properties and because the local government was quite up for it. Honda also had a factory in the local area, which helped. But there was a small problem, 
and that was the paperwork they had to fill out to get the necessary permissions to begin construction. Because they were constructing a racetrack and not just an automobile test site, the public and local government were under the impression that this track was going to be used for gambling, which required a different sort of paperwork and a lot of other legislation to get through. But, thanks to some persuasion, the local government saw what Honda was trying to do. That persuasion was... They got the authorities a tiny bit drunk. The project was approved with only one condition. Do not destroy the local rice fields. Unfortunately, there are no concept drawings of the layout. Initially, Honda wanted three crossovers and two hairpin turns that would have created the ultimate proving ground, but it just wasn't possible to build it in the confines of the land they had. And the track was also planned to be flat, but that wouldn't have made the place a world beater. So, Honda sent a team back to Europe to analyse what we'd got over here, and the ideas were all taken back to Japan, including samples of tarmac from the Autobahn in Germany. The company that paved the track spent six months looking for the right kind of materials because paving with asphalt wasn't something they'd done before. Honda also sent a telegram to John Hugenholtz, who had designed the Zandvoort circuit, saying, I'm building a circuit, please come to Tokyo. Signed, Soichiro Honda. When Honda was over in Europe personally during the mid-50s when he'd gone to the Isle of Man TT, he'd spent some time in England and Italy buying up basically as much stuff as he possibly could to take back to Japan where he and his team would dissect it and figure out what it was making European motorbikes so much better than Japanese ones. I mean, there wasn't a 20 kilo bag limit back then, so I think he would have been fine. What they came up with, with the help of Hugenholz, was this. And at first glance, it does look a bit familiar. A figure of eight course designed in that half the lap is clockwise and then half is anti-clockwise. So in theory, tyre wear is even when you're doing your testing and your racing. As the circuit is today, the circuit starts with the tightening turn one and then the S's section straight after that climbs up a hill, through Dunlop, and down towards the Degners. Well, singular Degner in this case. The corner is named after Ernst Degner, a man who had fled the advancing Red Army as it came into Germany and found himself in Poland, and after the war he became a motorcycle mechanic in Potsdam. Later on, in 1950, he joined a local motorcycle club and started racing 125cc bikes. In 1960, he wanted to defect from the Eastern Bloc, and Suzuki had come to the rescue. But just before he could escape into West Berlin, the wall was built, and he smuggled his family out of East Berlin in the boot of a car. Trunk, for American viewers. That same weekend, he was racing at the Swedish Grand Prix in Kristiansand, but then after the race, he drove to Gedze in Denmark before catching the ferry over to Holstein, where he'd then drive to meet his family in Dillingen. Now, it's not actually pronounced Gedze, it's probably pronounced something else. My brother would probably know how to pronounce it given that he lives in Denmark, but I'm sticking with Getze because Danish... It's a weird language. Degner went one better with this. When he got into West Germany, he managed to get himself a West German license. This being because on the other side of the Berlin Wall, the East German racing authorities had filed a complaint with the FIM, which is the FIA, but for motorbikes. They basically claimed that Degner had deliberately trashed his engine while he was in Sweden so that he could get away and get himself into Denmark and then escape that way and just get out of things earlier than originally planned. And because he was under investigation, that would have meant his East German racing license was under suspension. But because he now had a West German one, he was able to continue racing. The rest of the circuit is effectively as it is now. The hairpin, round to spoon, over the bridge, into 130R, round to the last corner. No chicane at this point though. The whole track was handling meets speed. The first race held at the circuit was in the November of 1962, the first Japan National Road Race, the rulebook for which was basically a modified version of the rulebook used for the Isle of Man TT, and riders were grouped by manufacturer rather than by engine size. 100,000 tickets were sold, but there was the small problem of rain. It absolutely chucked it down, much like it is doing today, but those who stayed were treated to their first ever views of motorcycle road racing. The speed, the smells, the noise, and the skill on show kick-started the first instances of proper, organised Japanese motorsport, the kind seen in Europe. And in this first ever race, that Degner bloke I was just on about crashed his car at the corner that bears his own name. He was quite badly injured, but he survived, and they renamed the corner Degner because, well, they were just happy that worse hadn't happened. The following year, cars arrived for the first time, and the popularity of the races, coupled with the road-building technology on show at the track, allowed the Japanese government to begin building their versions of autobahns, motorways, and interstates, with the first of these roads being opened in 1963 between Rito and Amagasaki, and the quality of cars and bikes increased too, and then in the autumn of 1964, the circuit was training the Japanese police forces in high-speed driving. 
Luckily, there's an Assetto Corsa mod for this track that allows you to see what the track would have been like in the early 1960s, so I'm going to use that for screenshots to sort of illustrate points in other parts of this video. If you want to see what an actual lap looks like, I highly recommend GP Lap's video on the subject, a link for which I will leave in the description so you can watch that at your leisure. He's very good at it. As time went on though, the cars got faster, and faster, and faster. By the early 1980s it was possible for cars to be coming over the start line towards turn 1 at around 200 miles an hour, so the circuit took the necessary steps to improve safety. The way they did this was by adding the chicane now seen at the end of the lap, the scene of Alain Prosonet and Senna's coming together in 1989. This chicane has been moved a couple of times over the years. In 1991 it was moved forward a bit before being moved back to its original position in 2003. Also in 1984, which was the year that that chicane was added, they tightened the exit of the spoon curve to allow for more runoff, and they also did some other bits and pieces the year before, so 1983. That was adding Armco to the entire track, which by European standards sounds very, very late. All the changes added up, and the circuit was ready for the 1987 Formula 1 season, when Suzuka would be the first ever, and still only, figure of eight circuit to host a Grand Prix. Gerhard Berger was the first man on pole, with pole position being on the dirty side of the grid, as it so happens. Exactly. There were also new medical facilities, and more done to make the circuit state-of-the-art and on par with anything that we have in Europe. Oh, and for the 1987 Formula 1 race, the Degners were made into the two 90-degree corners they are now. Well, 90-ish. A pair of corners that are quite the challenge in any car, as in some, you're breaking through the first and into the second, which can result in locking up. Unless you're in a modern F1 car where you just slam on the brakes as soon as the car is straight after the first one. The first ever F1 race at Suzuka was met with such anticipation that tickets had to be allocated through a lottery. But it was all worth it, because even now the Japanese fans are some of the most enthusiastic that the drivers will ever meet. And over the years the Suzuka circuit has seen high drama in the closing stages of a Formula 1 season. Prost and Senna in 89 and 1990. Damon Hill's out-of-body experience in 1994, Damon and Villeneuve having their winner-takes-all race in 1996, where Villeneuve's wheel ended up in the crowd, Schumacher's last to first challenge in 1998, Schumacher's engine blowing up in 2006, and the tragedy of Bianchi in 2014. It's also a track the drivers absolutely adore. A few years ago, Hamilton was heard on the radio exclaiming the circuit was amazing, and it's a track that's had minor modifications over the years but still maintained its flow. The main changes have been to the course's fastest and most demanding corner, the 130R, the scene of Alan McNish's massive shunt in a Toyota in 2002, and also the scene of Fernando Alonso's round-the-outside overtake on Michael Schumacher in 2005. But Suzuka wasn't a permanent position on the calendar, however. In 2007, the race switched to the Fuji circuit, owned by Honda rival Toyota, where it stayed for two years, and was supposed to be on for a bit longer. But the economy crashed in 2008, and initially Bernie offered an alternating deal between the two circuits, similar to how Hockenheim and the Nürburgring were supposed to. But Honda upgraded the whole circuit to improve the standards, and when Toyota pulled out of F1, Suzuka was able to snap up the Japanese Grand Prix deal too. When it comes to racing in games, I love this place. It's a great test of setup and consistency when the tyres start to burn off. It's also one of those old school tracks that despite change has maintained everything that made it awesome in the first place. Tricky corners, the elevation changes, the fact that for the most part mistakes are punished, and when rain is thrown into the mix as well, it makes it a challenge well worth attempting. When we think test tracks that are used for racing, the three that spring to mind are the likes of Catalonia, Paul Ricard and Manicourt. Three tracks that are, well, test tracks that get used for racing and don't offer much beyond that. But Suzuka? That's different. They got it so right. So it's not just a test track, it's not just a race track. And at the risk of sounding like a very popular motoring journalist, what Honda managed to do was take all the best bits of every corner in Europe and help create what is possibly one of the greatest tracks in the world. So then, a look at the history of the Suzuka circuit. If this has taught you something new here today, then do like the video so I know a good job was done. And for more like this, get subscribed with the bell on so whenever I do another video, you don't miss out. Massive thanks to the channel members and those who support via Patreon. And if you want to help support me on a more personal level, then a link to Patreon is in the description, along with links to socials, Discord, and the F1 Store affiliate. Under this video as well is the link to memberships and the button for super thanks if you just want to buy me a coffee. So until next time, I've been Aiden Mord. Have a great day wherever you are. And goodbye.